Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Just letting a few people up. Good morning, technically. I'm here in San Diego, actually. <laughs> good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Yeah, welcome everybody back. How's it going? How's We got some other speakers up here as well. Hello, guys. How's it going? Doing good, doing good. Happy to be back here for another episode. We are on episode three of our weekly series with Front, with the Front team, and we've had some good conversations, so I'm excited to be back. How how you been, Bianca? I have been busy, you know, as usual. Permissionless is coming up. I don't know if anybody's going, but that's going to be fun. Um, there's a ton of conventions happening this this month, actually, or I guess in September. So there's a lot of planning that's going there as well as this, you know, community building. A lot happening, a lot happening. And today we have another full stacked panel of some great speakers. And I know they're very busy and I'm excited to have some of you guys back and welcome to the new speakers. So we're just going to get right to it because I do not want to waste any time. I want to hear from you guys. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and just kick it off. Um, Bianca, you want to go ahead and start it off, maybe kick it off with introducing yourself? Yeah, so for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Bianca. I'm the community manager at Front. Um, been hosting here with Jess now a few times, um, and I'm excited to kind of curate the panels. We've been curating some really interesting conversations, especially as it pertains to like the world of Web3 and what that means. Um, onboarding and so on and so forth. So that's a little bit about me and I'll, um, I'll kick it off to Linus actually, since that's like the next person on my list that I see. Hey everyone. Uh, hey Jess. Hey Bianca. Great Welcome to be back. back. To the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we got an inside joke running that um, every time I come on this show, something catastrophic happens. Oh, if I'm not no. mistaken, the first two first two times it was uh, it was FTX crumbling. I feel like that was great timing for me to come on the show. And then the second time, I think it was the SEC's action against Coinbase. Um, but so far, so good. I think the morning's looking pretty strong. So maybe we'll break the streak. Um, sorry for that long winded uh, intro, but again, I'm really really happy to be back. Um, uh, I'm Linus. Uh, I've been in crypto and Web3 uh, for about six years or so. I was at Coinbase for a while. Uh, for the last year or so, I was at um, a Web3 startup called Origin Protocol um, and was kind of on this show a couple times uh, in my role there. Uh, but actually about uh, two months ago, started a new role leading product at Magic Eden, uh, which is a leading cross-chain uh, NFT platform. So excited to just talk about all things uh, Web3 on this show. Funny, um, funny enough, will... Linus, sorry not to, to cut you off, but uh, Linus oh, yeah. and I actually worked together back when he was um, at Origin Protocol through Jess for that connection. So, I mean, it just kind of goes to show the power of community building and like making sure that you continue to plug yourself in the space. And I, when I got onboarded into Front, I actually found out that Linus and Arjun go way back, back at their time when they worked um, at Coinbase together. So I'll let Arjun kind of introduce himself as well. Awesome. Thanks, Bianca. Hey, Jess and everyone else. Nice to be back. So, yes, it is definitely a small world. And, uh, and, the, and the world that cares about crypto might be a little smaller, expanding every day. Linus, nice, nice to see you again. We've... Uh, you know, we've shared quite a few tough days at Coinbase, but nice to see you again. So for everyone else who doesn't know me, I'm the VP of engineering here at Front Finance. My background has, uh, I spent a fair amount of years at uh, Coinbase. Before that, I spent a lot of uh, years in traditional finance and big banks such as Goldman Sachs. My intro to uh, you know crypto was early in 2013, 2014. I heard a podcast about Bitcoin. I read the white paper. I found it very interesting, and so I decided to buy some ASIC miners from old, really cheap ASIC miners from eBay. The good thing was in New York, my electricity was included as a flat fee in, in my rent, and so I had a small rig going uh, in my apartment, which my wife eventually made me shut down because uh, you know, she found that one article that says it might not be very healthy for us. Anyway, so that was how I got into crypto. I've stayed in touch with crypto over a few different jobs. Um, yeah, I started building a crypto trading platform after that and then moved over to Coinbase. And now here I'm at Front, working on the edge of security and UX and building products for the everyday user. 
happy to be back and uh, you know very intimidated intimidated with this uh, really really strong panel imagine how i feel <laughs> i'm just a crypto nerd and i and i was just going to comment on on the topic like i consume crypto and nfts like 12 hours a day and i still can't come up with like a straightforward answer or hear a consistent answer on this question so i'm excited to hear from all the big brains go ahead bianca no yeah i mean uh same here it's funny because um i i'm a consumer heavy consumer and the only reason really why I got so deep into Web3 was because of my fascination on like the the mindset behind it. Um, and, you know, that kind of just really took my career to the next level as it pertains to marketing and community building. Um, and I, I want to kind of cue it up to um, Monterey, who's known as Rivers. Actually, he and I worked um, at, back at Nifty's and now he has a completely different role in the space as well it just it just kind of goes to show that the builders in this space are also kind of evolving as the tech also evolves and I'm excited for what he's doing on over um, in his new role so I'll let him introduce himself as well uh, well thank you Bianca as uh, you mentioned I, I we work together at Nifty's um, we I was the head of product there uh, really focused on sort of the creator platform pivot um, when I took over earlier this year. Um, we were sort of acquired, which is awesome. And now I am working um, at a company y'all may have heard of called Moonbay. Did you just um, drop the, the, the alpha? Because I don't know if, it, if that's been officially announced, but that's sick that you're dropping yeah, it here. Yeah. Just... Don't, tell you, don't tell your friends. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm under NDA for that. But anyway, so uh, I work at, I'm work. i working as a product lead at MoonPay now. I'm really working in product strategy, specifically in the Web3 front. Um, we're working on some exciting things that uh, I don't think even it's been fully announced, but a lot of it is um, sort of uh, consumer-facing product and uh, sort of middleware infrastructure to enable creators uh, in the space and remove the friction and, uh, you know, some of the products that we we, we have in our uh, portfolio are like Hypermint, which powers a lot of uh, the NFT drops around, you know, one of the top three powers of NFT drops. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here and talk about the future of Web3 because I'm very bullish on the space, even if uh, our, you know, animal pictures are all down really bad. We, we, we're still going to make it, I think. That's funny. I, I think that's hilarious that you just dropped that <laughs> before it was announced. So you guys heard it here with uh, with Jess that uh, Nifty's was officially, I guess, um, acquired by MoonPay. And now we have some really cool, innovative stuff that I know of, luckily, um, prior to me transitioning on over to Front. Um, maybe Rivers does. He's, he's actually, you know what, notorious for dropping or spilling the beans. So it's kind of uh, on brand for you to drop them here as well. <laughs> Uh, but with that, I, I want to um, tee it on over to the uh, buyer team for him to introduce himself. I actually use the wallet myself. I think it's so important what they're doing with security. Um, and I'm excited for them to kind of uh, talk about Web3 in general, but also to maybe a little bit about what you guys are doing there as well. Yeah, welcome back, Jeff. How's it going? Hey, Jess, it's going great. How are you? Doing good. Yeah, so uh, before I jump in really quick, uh, last year I did, I gave up alcohol for the year and I was able to make it through the year. And you might remember this year I gave up coffee and it was uh, controversial when I came on the show, like everyone, you know, kicked it off with what are you, what's everybody drinking? And I said, oh, I gave up coffee, but I'm sad to announce that I didn't make it through the year. I, uh, I lost in like July. Uh, we've got a young baby, a little baby at home. And so I finally kind of cracked and I'm drinking a nice, uh, iced espresso right now out on a walk. So Back on the coffee train, uh, quick intro on myself. My name is Jeff Krantz. I'm a software engineer by trade. Uh, in 2012, I was working at Groupon, um, if anyone's familiar with that company, and the software engineer next to me gave me a nudge and uh, said, hey, Jeff, you ever heard of Bitcoin? I said, no. He said, you should check it out. It's the softest Bitcoin sell anyone's ever made. Uh, so I went home. I checked it out. I bought my first Bitcoin on eBay for like 32 bucks. And I've been in the space ever since. Um, and then, you know, I guess fast forward, I'll skip all the details. In like the spring of last year, 
uh, a good friend of, or an old friend of mine from college texted me and said, hey, Jeff, I know you're a crypto guy. I'm looking at my OpenSea account right now and I can't find my board ape. Could I send you my address and could you take a look? Maybe you guys see where this is going. He sent me his address. I took a look and he'd interacted with some sort of a, a phishing site that had stolen the board ape from his account when it was worth about a half a million bucks. And this got me thinking, hey, if this keeps happening to people, there's no way that Web3 goes mainstream. And so I invented a product called Fire, which is which today is an extension, Chrome extension that lives in your browser and pops up right next to your wallet and shows you what's going to happen if you click the blue button to sign that transaction in your wallet before you do. So in his case, it would have shown, hey, rather than getting an animated ape, your board ape's going to be sent to this other address. Are you sure you want to do this? Uh, our big announcement yesterday is uh, Fire V2 is coming out soon, which is going to be a fully fledged wallet. So rather than needing, you know, MetaMask and Fire to pop up, it'll just be one pop-up Fire, and you can just sign right in there. So excited for that. Fire is awesome, by the way. I use that, and uh, I just signed up for the the wait list today. So I suggest everybody do the same. Yeah, everybody needs to download that. Like that, I've used it, and it's um, definitely protected me. Um, as somebody who's very hyper aware of making sure I'm not clicking on anything malicious, so definitely. Um, but with that, uh, I want to kick it off on over to Wes. Welcome, yeah, hey Wes. Thank you for having me on here. Um, I'll jump right into it. My name is Wes. Uh, I handle a lot of the growth and marketing uh, here at Webacy. Um, I got into um, NFTs um, pretty similar to Linus. So I was an Ethereum miner for a few years. I uh, learned about NFTs through my partner that I was mining with, and the rest was pretty much history, um, pretty much helped out collections um, in early 2021. And then I taught myself solidity when I had a lot of downtime at home during the pandemic. Um, ended up getting into Webacy, uh, handling all the growth in marketing. And uh, Webacy itself started on the focus of what happens to your digital assets if you pass away. And a lot of us know and hopefully don't really ever encounter the scenario um, but a lot of it is pretty hard to get out of exchanges. It's hard to understanding and explaining to a loved one how to access your wallets if something ever happened to you. Um, so that was the basis for how WebC was created. We, we pretty much started the first on-chain digital will that was uh, pretty much created through smart contracts. So we gave users to go, the ability to go into our DAP and uh, deploy their own digital will on-chain, um, which was super cool. But... Um, just like Jeff was talking about, the biggest problem we were running into was that a lot of people ultimately wouldn't have the assets sleeping safely in their wallet. Um, they would click on malicious uh, interactions or scammers would target them and they would lose their assets. Um, so we transitioned and ultimately built a security suite that helps you assess and monitor and act. Um, so uh, we are pretty much different from fire though because fire you guys cover a lot of the front end um, interactions whereas we're more so on the back end so if you do click something malicious uh you can go into web C and in one click move all of the assets in your wallet to a fresh backup wallet to keep you safe love it and i think last but not least we have a uh, chris here um <laughs> who's a best friend now on the, to the show <laughs> Chris, welcome back. Yeah, I feel like when I start drinking again, we got to have a beer instead of just coffee. Love to hear all the stories of you guys coming back. It really gives me like all fuzzy feelings. Um, but yeah, Chris, what's up? Welcome Thanks back. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so for uh, those of you who don't know me, I've uh, been on the last, I've been on several of these actually now, and they're always really fun to fun to hop on and chat because it it provides that like, I'm not focused on everything that's going on at work and I just get to talk about the space and like communicate with others who are like-minded, which is always fun. Um, but I am director of sales engineering at Front. So I work alongside uh, Arjun and Bianca. And prior to this, I was at Coinbase as well, uh, where I was focused mainly in the staking and RPC infrastructure side of the house, formerly Bison Trails before they were acquired uh, and rebranded as Coinbase Cloud. Um, worked with a whole bunch of banks and whatnot prior to that, but I got my start 
in crypto actually when I was working at a tech company back in like 2011. Um, we were bridging or we were plugging liquidity providers into uh, new new uh, forex broker packages and selling the selling it as like a completely uh, built package. And my buddy, same thing, was just like, "Hey, have you ever heard of Bitcoin?" And I was like, "No." He goes, "Check it out." And at the time, I was actually working in tech support where we were running a whole ton of VMs. So I ended up spinning up a whole bunch of VMs and just let them run with the Bitcoin miner on it. And I have no idea where that wallet is. <laughs> I am that guy who mined a bunch of Bitcoin and have no idea where that wallet is. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had a story like that, but I, I can tell you right now that I would know exactly where I can <laughs> It was back um, when like Bitcoin was probably like 40 cents or something like that. So, oh, ooh, that hurts. Yeah, that but hurts in my you. mind, it wasn't like, oh my God, I need to keep track of this. And what's this like fake internet money right now? And I was just having fun setting up the company's VMs to mine it for me. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, all right. I think that is done with introductions. I don't know if Jesse want to kind of kick it off or I can. It's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. Kick it off. You all right. So, I mean, I feel like the term Web3 has been controversial as of lately, uh, as I peruse Twitter or X now. Um, and I don't think people truly fully understand what Web3 means or who, wh where it even came from, which is it was introduced by Ethereum's uh, Gavin Wood. Um, and there with that, people are like, well, what's Web1 and what's Web2? And like, what? why is Web3 important? And I think having these conversations are important in general because it just kind of goes to show how technology evol evolves and how like how human needs evolves and how becoming aware and knowledgeable in the space is very important as you know especially all of us here who are early because we're still very early to the technology that's being um advanced you know every everybody here as you can see has history in the space um and i it's i can't wait to hear from everybody and their thoughts on what their definition of web3 means so i kind of want to the, the way we've done it in the past is I'm going to ask a question, probably going to pick on somebody. And then from there, if anybody wants to chime in, just raise your hand and I'll like kick it off to you. Um, so I'll kind of start off and I'll, I'll pick on Rivers because I haven't chatted with you in a minute. Um, like, how would you describe Web3 to somebody who is unfamiliar with the term? Yeah, I get to start it off. Uh, okay, let me try not to mess this up. Um, so uh, Web3 to me is sort of, it's the next evolution, the next step of the internet, right? Web, you know, we say Web two right now is, in my opinion, if we want to enter, understand that, introduced to like commerce a lot was a big was a big play, and I mean, there's a lot of lot of lot of things behind it. But so, what does Web three introduce to me? Uh, it's sort of interoperability is one of the key focuses, uh, in my opinion. Um, being able to take your digital self. Uh, own your digital self and uh, take it to different, um, you know, websites or different uh, applications um, without having to create a whole new profile, a whole new sort of sense of self there. Uh, so your digital identity, you kind of own your digital identity. You you bring it with you over time. We're eliminating the idea of like passwords and things of that nature. Sort of like what one password did for the Web two world. Uh, that's kind of what your wallet does in the Web3 space. Um, uh, and, and it really gives uh, sort of empowers uh, regular or sort of like like the users uh, and sort of decentralizes it, if you will, away from uh, the full control away from like big organizations uh, as it is today. So it, again, I think the key component to me maybe is interoperability. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, sort of, again, dig full digital ownership of yourself and your identity. So I'll go with that to start I off. I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's a loaded question. I think, um, what's important here is that, and I'll talk a little bit about the history and then anybody can chime in is, um, web three would not have been made possible if it weren't for web one where the internet was basically static and read only. And then in web two, where Rivers pointed out the era of social media uh, and user generated content, um, 
and the rise of tech giants basically started to control the narrative that we were seeing and like really controlling the data that we see it today on web two, right? And so with web three and decentralization, that's kind of where like blockchain technologies and the evolution of web three comes into play. So with that, I kind of want to tee it off to maybe whoever wants to answer this, like, what do you think the symbiosis between blockchain technologies and the evolution of web three are? I'm I'm happy to take. I could jump go, in. Oh. Go for it. Yeah, sure. Um, really quick. So my definition and my bar for Web three is user control. Are the users in control? Uh, you know, of the platform, of their data, um, of the IP. You know, and you don't necessarily need to meet the bar on all of those, but. The general idea is in web, a web, to be a Web3 application, the user should be in control. And to jump to the question of the kind of um, connection between blockchain and Web3, you know, I think for the users to be in control, um, first off, the users need to control their own identity. You know, if, if, for example, you look at Twitter, they're stealing usernames from people that have had them for decades right? Because, you know, they want the X username or the music username or whatever it is. And so if you don't even control your own account, your own identity on the platform, how can you control the platform itself? And so because we control our own identities in Web3, that allows us to also in turn, you know, play a role in controlling, you know, a DAO or a protocol or, you know, our, our identity, uh, cryptocurrency, of course. That's kind of uh, my high level thought on it. Yeah, does anybody else want to chime in on that? Arjun, I'm uh, I, muted. Yeah. Go ahead. I can add a few thoughts. Uh, so I think web, when it comes to Web3 itself, I'd say it's a movement that's being designed from the grounds up with the goal of transitioning decision-making from the hands of the few to the hands of the many, to the hands of the actual asset owner, whether that, that asset be data, money, art, or value in some other form. It's also the place where inclusion doesn't have to be fought for or safeguarded, but it's such a basic primitive that the system just ceases to function without it, right? So the central ethos of Web3 to me is around ownership, choice, and inclusion. I'm sure there are smarter people than me who can tell you the many technologies out there that will be able to give you these three, but very few that can do it so aptly as a combination of like cryptography, decentralization, and consensus. That package is what I think we call blockchain technology. So yeah, I think Web3 is the movement while blockchain technologies and distributed ledger technologies are the technologies that power this movement. I love that. And Arjun, I just want to kick it off to you again because you put it so eloquently. Uh, How do you think Web3 will reshape the user's role in the digital ecosystem? It'll sound very similar to what I think I just said, right? Uh, From like going back to the previous question, because I think that's a good way to answer this one, which is web one was uh, between web one, web two and web three, the the role of the role that user played was a little bit of a differentiating factor, right? What I mean by that is web one was very, the user was very passive, mostly a consumer of static and uncurated content, like Bianca said. Web two, the interaction is still quite passive, but there are glimpses of active involvement but you're still only doing the things that someone would explicitly allow you to do, right? Like killer applications, like maybe around the theme of communication, like email, AOL messenger, social networking. Web3 changes that quite a bit in terms of involvement from the user. It goes from passive involvement to true active participation. They take control of the decision-making. So the decision-making is closest to the asset owner. Things like my keys, my crypto, my deci- my assets, my decision. I like to think of Web3 as like boots on the ground, right? And that's why you get to make these decisions. And that's why I think like boots on the ground is a apt way for me to think about it, right? Where situations such as uh, you get to decide how your data is going to be used. You get to decide when your data is going to be used. You get to decide where your data is going to be used and also not same about your attention, all of this control, all of these decision-making factors are for 
queue the end user, and the end user can be anyone from any community, from any geography with any background. Yeah, you know, I think you bring up a really important part here because I think most people in the space don't truly understand what Web3 means. I mean, some would argue that Binance and Coinbase aren't truly decentralized because to your point, your keys, I mean, not your keys, not your crypto, right? So with that being said, I mean, do you truly believe that Web3 as it is now is inherently decentralized? And if so, or if not, why is decentralization vital for its vision? And I'll leave that to anybody to to answer that. So, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that per se, but it's it's an interesting question to ask because in general with the whole validator construct of, you know, blockchain, right, is you are decentralized. I mean, and I think what Ethereum did with putting a cap of 32 ETH per validator, well, soft cap, but... 32 ETH per validator, they inherently are forcing distribution of the ledger. And I think there's probably, I, don't, I haven't looked recently, but I think there's like six or 800,000 total validators at this point, where now the ledger is so well distributed that there's no potential that anybody could take over the ledger. Anybody um, could, you know, go and do a 33% attack or 51% attack, or, you know, whatever it may be. So by the outside looks of it, yes, it is decentralized. However, when you start looking at where all of this infrastructure is hosted, and there was a really um, prominent uh, article written in the middle of last year, I believe it was, um, where basically they said most of the validator infrastructure was housed by Amazon and second to that was on GCP. So if Amazon went down, like Amazon in theory could take down an entire blockchain, entire L1. Um, so it's a hard question to answer, I think, when you're talking about if just general, and now you're getting also into proof of work versus proof of stake, because I know Bitcoin mining versus validating transactions through uh, proof of stake, there's some differentials in there as well. But is it Decentralized, yes, but if you're looking at it from a validator level versus if you're looking at it from where are those validators actually housed, um, it's relatively centralized. So then the question is, is Binance and Coinbase who are centralized per se, does it really make a difference if they're centralized regardless of even if the infrastructure itself isn't, is centralized also? So I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer to those questions, or that, to that question, but just some thoughts. That may spark some interesting conversation. No, yeah, I think that's really interesting what you just said. And Linus, uh, go ahead. I saw that you opened it up, but I think that opens up the conversation for even a broader, you know, for us to like touch on. So go ahead, Linus. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, no, I wanted to chime in on the last two questions. Um, first on what is the, the changing role of the user? Um, you know, there was something, there's this really powerful uh, maybe even kind of like cheesy quote from uh, this documentary about the evils of Web 2, where there are two industries where the end customer is called the user, and that's uh, the internet industry uh, and the drug industry. And I just thought that was like so powerful, right? Like we, we use this term uh, user so uh, so kind of casually, um, but ultimately it is like, hey, the, the product of Web 2 is ultimately like the user, like they're basically a, a means to an end for a centralized corporation to profit. And I think that the role of a user in the Web3 context is needs to be elevated to be like almost like a citizen of a nation or a citizen of a neighborhood, right? Um, that there is responsibility for the user to kind of guide and help govern and help determine the future of the platform and the product. And I think that that's incredibly powerful. And a democracy, for example, really only works with an engaged citizenship base. And it, I, I recognize that it's unrealistic for a user of many, many apps to, to kind of deeply care about governance votes and all of these things for every single app that they use. But the option, the optionality of that to happen is really, really powerful in Web3. And I think that the ultimate end state is people might be end consumers or end customers of many, many apps but they have the ability to really, really go deep on the things that they're passionate about. 
Um, and so I think that there is this element of like giving power to the hands of the users uh, that is incredibly powerful. And I think that that will ultimately be the evolution that people will find their communities and the things that they're really passionate about and be able to go super deep and, and really like govern and, and guide the future direction, uh, the things that they care about. And as for whether or not Web3 is inherently decentralized, now I think that ultimately there's, there's pros and cons to centralization and decentralization. With, with a decentralized model, things just move slower. And I think that when you're you know, building something from the ground up, whether it's a new protocol, a new product, a new startup, you probably want to be a little bit more centralized in the beginning because it's, it's really, really slow and really, really difficult to get stuff done. Um, but ultimately, like building in uh, constraints into, say, the smart contracts or governance or building in public, basically like living those values that we will be decentralized and we pro progressively be giving more and more power to our community uh, is, is really important. And I don't think anybody's figured it out yet, but I think that that's really, really, that's what's really exciting about Web3, that we're, we're building it. And seeing teams progressively live these values of we are handing over the keys to the community once we're ready, it, it is really, really uh, inspiring. And so I think that, I don't think it should be necessary for things to be decentralized from day one, but it is important that teams, like real teams building this, demonstrate through their actions uh, over time that they are like progressively decentralizing and giving away power. And that's something that you just don't see. You just don't see in governments, you don't see in history, and you don't see in technology until now. And that's what's really powerful about Web3. Go ahead, Chris, or Rivers. We have two Chris's, so I'll just say Rivers. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do. I mean, yeah, I tend to agree that definitely is the power of Web3. Um, but a counterpoint to that would be that inherently people uh, don't want to build the product. They want to use the product. Um, so, like, the metaverse didn't work or hasn't worked so far because, honestly, no one wants to build it. Right. Like I can tell someone what to build it. And when we get to the point where I can tell AI what to build it, maybe it'll start to flourish. But like, you know, people were like, uh, there were like, you know, uh, NFT worlds uh, dropped and no one really built on that on top of that, like uh, WWW web or like, you know, World Wide Web three, you know, whatever um, that dropped. And, you know, that had some cool things that people could do, but no one did anything because people want to consume a product, not necessarily build it. So like, if Web3 requires uh, people to be involved or to intervene, uh, I think that uh, will reduce mass adoption or reduce the, the, the spread of mass adoption quickly. Because like, I guess my example could be like, like I wanna own an iPhone, I don't necessarily wanna design it uh, or like vote to necessarily I wanna design it. And a lot of people do, but you know, the people that do are sort of those early adopters, the people that are in the space right now. But like my vision for like the future of Web3 is going to be we're, we're using technology and it just we're, we're just using it in our daily lives. The products fit into our daily lives and they're powered by sort of the blockchain because that what's, that's what makes the most sense, right? And I think you were spot on about the centralization, but I love that point. Like we all think of it decentralization, decentral ethos, like I'm an on-chain maxi, but honestly, most of like the NFT collections are centralized in some form or fashion, right? Like their metadata is all hosted on AWS. You know, they're not hosted on chain because doing stuff on chain, especially on L1s is very expensive. So certainly not very consumer friendly uh, at the current state. Um, but as we start to adopt technologies like um, account abstraction, um, start to move the transactional signing away from uh, the user and move like sort of the, the gas payments away from the user um, and set up ways for you to either sponsor gas from big companies or uh, to um, be able to just set up a wallet, which is like, you know, my, my funding wallet. And it doesn't matter what chain I'm operating on. It doesn't matter what I'm trying to do. I don't have to sign a transaction necessarily. It's sort of pre-signed for me. And, and obviously there's you know, a lot of security that has to go into it, but it's those types of things that I think, you know, like will allow me to use uh, my crypto as like in my Apple wallet when I go to like Whole Foods to get groceries and that's mass adoption to me. And all that is very centralized experience, but it's on top of decentralized technology. So like I do think companies and products 
will probably skew towards centralization in order to make them you know, user friendly and work. And then uh, the technology underhering sort of the underlying technologies will inherently be uh, decentralized. And so uh, I think that's how it's going to work. I mean, mostly because I've seen DAOs and uh, I've yet to see one <laughs> operate efficiently, right? Versus a company like in the Web2 space who can actually make decisions, even in startups, stuff like that. So, um, and, and I'm not trashing DAOs or anything. I know a lot of them actually do work. I'm just saying some of my experiences so far. But anyway, yeah, so that's what I think for some counterpoints. But I, I love all the points everybody's making. This is great. Go ahead, Jess. I don't know why you're raising it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add in because, yeah, I love what you guys are saying. And sometimes, you know, like when Nor when I call normies, like my friends, they think about, you know, Web3 decentralization is like they think complicated. Like this is going to take, you know, just an hour to tell me how to do this. And I don't want to spend time on that. So where do we find that balance between or how do we find that balance between user um, user experience and still stay on the decentralization um, point of it. And then on the other side, like, I don't feel like everything needs to be decentralized. Like, I don't need, you know, my grocery list on the blockchain or things like that. So how do you guys see finding that balance or, or how do you think we can improve that experience so that people that are using these decentralized apps don't even care? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, this is something that I've changed my opinion on a lot over my, I guess, 11 years in crypto. You know, I started off originally as like a Bitcoin maxi and spending a lot of time in the, you know, uh, Bitcoin subreddit, which is this, what is and was a super Bitcoin maxi community. I mean, it was really the only like crypto community to be in at the time. Uh, and, you know, the chant is not your keys, not your crypto. And I, you know, I still believe in that at the end of the day. But what I don't believe in is that a normie, their first step needs to be to go out and buy a ledger and set up a ledger to, you know, mint their first free NFT or something like that. I think it can actually be and should be a gradual transition, um, kind of like we were saying earlier, even like the same thing for a startup. You maybe gradually transition from centralized with the intention of getting to decentralized. I think a user and a consumer can do the same thing. So, you know, if you just want to mint a free NFT on an L2, like you should be able to just use a custodial wallet to hold that NFT for you. There's, there's no, there's, the risk is very low. And then let's say, you know, you end up accumulating a couple free NFTs that are now worth something, 50 bucks or something like that. Maybe at that point, you end up switching over to some sort of shared custody MPC wallet you know, where you're starting to take a little bit of control of your keys, but you're still obfuscating kind of the hard parts to, to a third party. And maybe from there, you can take your balance from 50 bucks to a thousand bucks and feel pretty comfortable. And then maybe at that point, it's time to, you know, take your own keys in your control. You understand what's going on a little bit more on the blockchain. You understand what custody means. And at that point, you kind of make the leap to full custody. And then down the line, when you're, you know, maybe your balance grows to $20,000 or something, then you go out and buy a ledger or set up a multi-sig. But it just seems like today the recommendation is, you know, not your keys, not your cheese, go get a ledger, set it up, you know, put everything, put your funds in a multi-sig and it's just overkill and it's never going to onboard new folks. So I think, uh, I think a transition like that would make a lot more sense. I, I love that. I think right now um, I would kind of want to talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, in the space. A lot of you guys have kind of brought up some points, some really important points. And, you know, Jess also mentioned like very true. I don't want everything decentralized. Like <laughs> it's, I just want it to be accessible. Right. And I right now kind of want to give you all the opportunity to talk about what you guys are doing with your projects and what you perceive is a challenge and how you guys are, you know, like combating that. And maybe we can kick it off with the front team because, you know, why not? It's, it's, I'm going to have them shill us for a second. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bianca. Um, I'll, I'll spend a few quick seconds on the decentralization aspect first. So for me, like, I'll take it a slightly different direction, slightly philosophical in nature, which is, uh, Web3 is about choice and inclusion, right? And across any cross-section of the human race, there are going to be differences in philosophies, morality, and true inclusion is one that um, harbors beliefs, even if 
they're not yours or they're not the same as yours, right? So the way to do that is access and representation, which is really another way, way of saying decentralization, I think. Uh, when it comes to challenges, for me personally, I think the biggest challenge here is time, right? Change takes time. Good change takes time. The financial system as we know it today has been since the like equities as an S class, 1600s, bonds even before to fund wars, right? Um, Bitcoin and crypto, 14 years old. So it is going to take some time, right? And it's up to us to move that pace of change, move that pace of change of adoption. And uh, the advantage of crypto that crypto has is in some ways a disadvantage as well, which is it's very broad. It applies in so many different situations, but also that leads to some lack of focus, which is like, I don't know of a single value corridor that crypto has truly, truly owned. Let's like, let's say remittance, right? I would love to see that happen. Like take a value vertical, take a value corridor and completely own it. And that's when it becomes indispensable. That's when it becomes like an, a need for uh, like the efficient functioning of society and the economy. Now to shield front a little bit, I think there is a lot that we are doing on you know, uh, to move some of these initiatives forward, right? Uh, some of the things that we're doing is we're building products with the end user in mind. We're building products that address that gap between UX and security. We're building products that can make it seamless and can make it completely secure. And uh, your experiences using front products like embedded deposits, embedded payments will be like your experiences using products outside of the crypto realm. So they should seem familiar. They should seem like things you have done before. And so that is a big emphasis for us. How do we build products that are crypto first, that can onboard that next billion people, uh, but also do so in a secure way and also do so in a very, very easy to, easy to use way. Great points, Arjun. Go ahead, Bianca. No, I was, uh, I love the way Arjun just speaks. He speaks so eloquently. I mean, I think uh, there's so much happening in the space as it pertains to TradFi and, and DeFi and how everything is kind of interconnecting. Uh, and they're starting to really kind of lean into the, I, I I'm, I'm, hope I'm saying this right, because I, I heard Chris say it in a meeting yesterday, which is the money transfer APIs um, and for, for um, to make things a little bit more, I believe, decentralized. Um, but make it in a seamless way. Um, I love what we're doing over our front. And there's a lot of people who are utilizing our use case to simplify things as it comes to um, decentralization. Um, or I guess not really decentralization. Or go ahead, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I switched to headphones. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So if if I opine a little bit further on... Um, what everybody's been saying, especially what Arjun was just saying about like the ownership aspect of what Web3 is and Web3 owning one specific. Um, you know, one thing I, I saw, because everybody. Always... Is, is he rugging or is it me? Yes. Yes. We're losing him. Oh, you yeah there? Yeah, we can oh. hear you. I don't know. You can hear better. You're cutting in and out. Though. Your audio has been decentralized. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, Much better. Can you hear me now? Okay, cool. Okay, so I just took my headphones off. Um, apparently, they were causing a problem. Um, so um, I lost my train of thought. Um, so basically, where where I saw like NFTs really hitting the mark is, you know, like I, I see it from the art perspective of just like a creator being able to continually um, earn off of what they generated as art and whatnot, but also from like ticketing, right? So if you look at like Ticketmaster, and I think this is like a really good use case, and I'm, and I'm sure all the NFT creators on here are probably cringing at the fact that I'm going down the ticketing route here. But I think with what we've seen from like Ticketmaster specifically, the just price gouging that happens and who really owns the tickets and the resale values. And, you know, you see people paying like $30,000 to go see Taylor Swift for a couple hours in the pouring rain um, at Patriot place where the Patriots play. And, you know, 
what does that really mean? Like, what do you, what do you own in that? And I think web three can help transform just the ticket space alone and own the ticket space. So now, and I think the Mavericks, the Dallas Mavericks are actually doing that as we speak where they're allowing you to actually create a wallet through just a QR code in the stadium to own your ticket through an NFT. And that's their like push to try and get users into the web three world where eventually I can see it being like all tickets are distributed just through an NFT. And now your ticket is an NFT and you own it in, you know, perpetuity and you can trade it and you can sell it or whatever you want to do. And as a sports collector, like I miss the fact that they have physical tickets. So like when I go to a game that's got some notoriety or something to it, like I don't have a physical ticket. So it's not like it's something I can hold on to that may appreciate in value where in an NFT, it actually can. And having that one section or sector of ownership help with broader adoption and, or I don't want to say mass adoption, maybe mass adoption. Um, but having that one sector of ownership being the catalyst for many other users to get into the space then also opens up the doors of how do you interact with, you know, luxury brands that have NFTs that specifically identify your ownership of a purse or a car like Porsche and Coca-Cola have released their collections and whatnot as well. But then getting into like actually the payment side and payout side and whatnot where, you know, and then that's where I think what Arjun was saying about like where we're trying to really help with the transfer of assets. Like right now it's very difficult in a very archaic financial system to move your assets from A to B where what we're trying to do is abstract that complexity out of the out of the um, equation so that it's easy to take. If you want your NFTs over here or over there, it's easy to transfer them, whoever you want to transfer them to. Very simple. You can transfer um, your tokens that you hold or your coins that you hold. And there's, there's very low effort involved in that where now in the current system, when you try to go transfer money, you got to pay $25 for a wire or an ACH to a bank account to another one. And it's a very difficult process, which I think Web3 helps solve that once it's adopted on a broader scale, but starting with like what Arjun was saying in one specific area that really helps catalyst the user um, acceptance. Completely agree. All great points. Thanks so much for sharing that. And as we are starting to wrap up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it over to Wes, maybe with this question, and then uh, kind of go around the room and, and hear about what everybody is working on. But looking forward, let's look forward. How do you guys see me, uh, the Web3 space evolving, me, whether it's if in your particular field or in other fields? And what are you guys doing in your current role to help improve that or innovate that? I'd love to kick it off to Wes to start that off. Yeah, absolutely. I think it kind of goes back a little bit to what we were talking about, just uh, making the entire UI, UX, and the ecosystem um, a bit easier. Right now, it's just uh, there's too many things you have to sign. There's just uh, it, it's a bit hectic for users to even transfer assets. Um, but I think just simplifying everything, um, and that's what we're working on at Webacy, is pretty important for the future of the space. Um, I mean, security wise, it's like if you get home security, you're not going up to your home security every day and making sure it's still there, making sure it's OK. Um, so we're more so just trying to focus on uh, creating something that's more so automatic that, you know, is always there. It's just a backbone and you don't have to consistently check up on it. Um, so that's our goal. But I'm just a firm believer that if we want to advance further into the space, the entire UI and UX within the, the ecosystem uh, definitely needs to move forward. Yep, that's, I completely agree. I think, you know, as, you know, somebody might call me a content creator, or educator, like explaining to people who are not in crypto and NFTs how to onboard, it's like a half a day ordeal. 
So being able to simplify that would make my life easier in many ways, in many ways. Um, what about, I'll go ahead and throw it over to Rivers. What about you, Rivers? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree, um, you know, with, with what you just said. And, uh, you know, I would piggyback on that sort of like uh, security is an important thing um, as well, uh, because, you know, we see those, you know, every day we see people clicking links and they're losing you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, you know, just by just by a small mistake. And that won't work for mass adoption, right? Like a, a, a person has to be able to feel like when they put money into something uh, that it's not going to just poof be gone like we're uh, a South, on South Park going to a bank account or something, right? Um, so, uh, so I think that's really important. And I really think uh, what's going to push that forward um, is account abstraction. I think that's an incredibly uh, huge technology should be uh, being adopted soon. There's a couple wallets that use it already. There are more coming out soon. There's infrastructure uh, products. Um, so I think, um, you know, sort of what smart contracts, the layer of protection they can offer uh, certainly will help advance the field. And also like the fact that I can spin those up with just my email address. I don't need, you know, kind of like magic link only there's no kind of keys involved too. I, personally, I think that's sort of where, where the future lies, or at least a good step in it, uh, in, in moving us forward. And, and what I'm working on is sort of, uh, enabling all of these technologies to come together um, in a, an incredibly user-friendly way for um, uh, creators, businesses, et cetera, to build upon. So if you have an idea um, and you want to uh, put it out in the world, you shouldn't have a lot of friction in your way, right? You should be able to uh, stand up those ideas and the technology should work for you, not against you. So uh, turning everything all set up for like, con like no one should need to know solidity is, right, like as like an entry point, like that should not be a barrier to entry to our space. So being able to create contracts that are customized and, and usable uh, with just wizards and things like that is really important. Pay rails, uh, on and off ramps uh, and having everything in one place without having to like go to seven different places to do a DeFi trade, which you probably you have to today if I want to go for like a whole loop. Uh, so the end to end experience is what I'm kind of focused on um, and, and sort of building up almost like an Adobe uh, experience cloud for uh, creators uh, on that end. And for like the front end users, think about uh, if an app was your, your crypto app was just like PayPal and I could use it everywhere. Um, I didn't have to think about it. all my payment methods were there, um, all that stuff. So I think, you know, that's that from a user perspective, sort of that type of uh, an experience is what we're focused on building. And so uh, now we have a lot of the resources to do it. And so that's hopeful, hopefully what you'll see coming out of uh, our, our little uh, niche of the product world uh, soon. Love it, love it. Yeah, and he, you did drop some alpha earlier. I'm not going to say it, but if you want to hear it, you could play it back at the end of the space because it might have been unintentional, but we'll leave it at that. Um, but no, great, great points, and thanks for joining the, the convo. Uh, Linus, you're up on my screen. Um, any thoughts about where, where Web3 is headed? And I know you just started with ME, but wh what are you thinking? Is, uh, what are you thinking now with your new role? Yeah, yeah. Um... In terms of where Web3 is headed, I, I think we're headed to a world where, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously uh, bullish and Web3 maxi, but I, I think it's going to uh, be pervasive. And I also think it's going to be hybrid, right? Like, uh, like what Bianca said, uh, Web2 uh, couldn't happen without Web1, right? And it wasn't like there was this huge divide of, is this a Web1 app or a Web2 app? No, like the internet just evolved and we started calling it Web2. Two. And that right now it just feels like, is this a web three app or is this a web two app? And I think that we should just be moving in a direction where it's all just web three. There's going to be elements of this that are centralized. There's going to be elements that feel familiar, like social aspects of it. Like Jess, you, you had mentioned this uh, great example of like, you don't want your uh, grocery list on the blockchain, but you might be using in the future, a grocery app where most things are off chain. Uh, but there might be, say, I don't know, a rewards program where that part might be on chain and that part might be quite inclusive that, to include multiple grocery apps. And you can actually take that with you. Right. And so 
I think that there's just going to be this element where uh, app developers, companies will, will say, hey, let's take the best of all worlds. And these parts that are the superpowers of being on chain um, are just going to be integrated into the app in a very smooth experience. And I'm also uh, maybe potentially a bit of a uh, contrarian take. There's a lot of folks that say, hey, we need to completely abstract the blockchain, completely abstract it so it feels like you're just using a Web2 app. And I, I wouldn't go that far. I, I think that um, it's going to take a little bit more of the path of uh, the internet where you know certain things are becoming going to be like require much less technical knowledge. But you know when you're online. You know how to connect to Wi-Fi. You know what it means to go off on airplane mode. Uh, you know how to unsubscribe from emails. And those kinds of things, I think, are going to be important through just regular usage. You know, the diff you know when you're using an app on your phone versus using the Safari mobile browser, and it, you know the difference of that. And I think that it's going to be important for people to know when they're on-chain, when they're interacting on-chain, and what that means, and when they're off-chain. And I think that that's going to be an important distinction that allows people to say, hey, this is on-chain, and I like it, and that's what I want, and this is off-chain, and that makes sense. And I think that that's just going to be a part of daily life. Um, and in terms of Magic Eden, um, you know, one thing that I'm inspired by is um, our conviction right now. We, we are a multi-chain company. I think we are one of the few, I hope that we're, we're not, you know, one of the only for, for a long time, but like one of the few to kind of be a, you know, fairly successful DAP on multiple chains. Um, and I think right now in Web3 and crypto, there's a bit of this tribalism, which I understand, right? Like people want to pump their bags, right, a about chains and this tech and that tech and for us to succeed you have to fail and um i think the future is multi-chain and i think it's already here and so an example of this is when we we moved into ordinals you know i i talked to you know people that are crypto ogs people that onboarded me into the ethereum ecosystem and kind of said hey like have you heard of bitcoin ordinals and they're just, just sort of like yeah i've heard about it like I've heard it's like really hard to get into, like I just haven't looked into it. And I think that what was really fascinating about that is like this thing came out and in the beginning it was very, very difficult. You had to run your own Bitcoin node. There was like OTC trading using spreadsheets. It was crazy. But like the speed with which the user experience got to a place where it's it's pretty darn comparable to buying an NFT on any other chain and Magic Eden being, you know, a first early mover to kind of like make that experience as smooth as possible, really reducing the barriers for, I mean, not normies quite yet, but like at least crypto people on other chains to kind of get into ordinals. That, that, that's kind of part of our mission right now, just like reducing the barriers, starting with the people that are still active in the space of like, let's just have fun, let's get great content, let's connect creators and artists to their fan base, regardless of chain. Um, and let's grow the ecosystem together. And so that's what we're working on. And that's what I'm excited about. Love it. And yeah, I'm glad to have you back. And I will be counting down to the end of the day, hoping that nothing happens uh, with my fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> but thanks, Linus. Uh, Jeff, what about you? You're up. A any thoughts about the direction of Web3? And let us know. I know you guys had the huge announcement yesterday. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yes, yes, I'll be quick because I think uh, everyone else has kind of shared the same sentiment that I have. You know, our mission at FIRE is to make Web3 safer by making it simple. So we're really trying to strike that combo that everyone's been mentioning of safety and UX. Um, yeah, I mean, since we launched FIRE as a, as a security tool, the number one request we've been getting from our users has been, hey, you know, I love the FIRE UX. It's kept me safe from these scams. Why can't it just be my wallet? I like the UX 10X better than MetaMask. Um, and so we said, hey, great, that's music to our ears. Um, you know, people have asked me for a long time, why did we name the product Fire? And it's because we've always wanted to build a wallet and Firewall, Fire Wallet is a little bit of a play on Firewall. Um, so could finally share that. Yeah, and I mean, what we're excited about is just making a really slick UX and fixing some of the huge hurdles we see to onboarding folks into Web3 still to this day. You know, we're seeing a lot of wallets come out lately, but most of them, you know, they say they're uh, providing a new UX, but really they're just providing like a new flashy UI. We see a ton of opportunities to fi fix the actual UX to make onboarding easier and help the user understand Web3, 
Um, and we're just really excited. You know, we're all about shipping and we haven't shipped like a new product in a few months as we've been building this thing out. So uh, excited back to get back into a cadence of, of shipping and, and releasing cool stuff. Thanks, Jeff. Always appreciate your time and looking forward to the wallet launch. And last but not least, uh, to Chris or Arjun, I'll throw it over to whoever wants to go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think I think everybody, I think for the most part, has covered covered the um, Web two to Web three thought process. So I don't I don't think I have anything unique perspective wise to put there. Unfortunately. Um, I definitely think there's a level of abstraction that has to happen, but I also agree with it can't be completely abstracted. It's just a natural evolution. Um, that'll, it, it takes time. And Arjun said this, it takes time. It's only been 14 years. I think by the time, like my kids are my age, like the, the world is a whole different place when it comes to what web three actually is. Um, <clears throat> but as for, as for what we're working on, you know, over at front, is we're really trying to make it easy for users to transfer assets between locations. And, and it always comes back to ownership. It's your assets. So it should be easy to move your assets to wherever you want to without it being a very negative user experience. And right now, how it is, is very negative. It's, it's anybody who's really committed to moving their assets will move their assets. But when you start introducing like, all of these different clicks and steps and I authorize this and I agree with this statement and I'm not sure what this smart contract is doing, but I'm, I'm going to accept the terms of the smart contract in order to send it auto bridge and then have it distributed. Like in order to get these assets from all these different places, it's just, it's hard. And what we're trying to do is make that very easy. Um, because Web3 is not completely abstracted yet, you know you're working in Web3, but the ability to move assets is much more familiar using just a simple username and login. So like if I were in my Fire Wallet, I could connect to my Coinbase account through my Fire Wallet and transfer my assets directly into my Fire Wallet and not have to do more than probably like five, five clicks or four clicks in order to get those assets out of there and into my Fire Wallet. Um, and that's what we're, we're really trying to streamline. And we've got several, several um, extensions of that simplicity that we are building on as well. Love it. Arjun, anything you wanted to add? It's always difficult when you go last because there's not a lot of meaningful material to add. Uh, but when it comes to Web3 over the next, you know, the matur maturation of Web3, I see things like, identity, proof of personhood, provenance, like real world acceptance, uh, real world assets on the on the platform, things like that, right? Uh, increased adoption fueled by value, increased adoption fueled by regulation, which will probably be fueled by the need to actually, and I mean actually underscore the word actually protect citizens, uh, perhaps increased adoption because of uh, AI and AI agents. And uh, I also see like cycles of escalation and de-escalation of frauds and scams. And that's why this community exists to make sure we can fight against all of that and make it easy for everyone. Great, great insights. Um, I really appreciate your time. I, I know you guys are all busy. Guys, make sure to follow each other. Make sure to listeners and make sure to follow all the speakers. It would be great to, for you guys to connect because I... I'm just going to throw this in, but I know another thing is like, we have so many applications. So I would love to see more people collaborate together. Ooh, Jess, you're rugging. I don't know if it's me. You're rugging a little bit. Yeah, you're rugging, Jess. Here, so I'll let you go. No, yes. Yeah, so I think what she was trying to say is that everybody here is working on a lot of really cool and innovative stuff, and I could see a lot of crossover. So be sure to follow each other, reach out, reach out to me if you want to be part of any future spaces. We have a, a, a next Thursday um, developing a powerful use case, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if anybody um, in the crowd it wants to feels like they can add value to that let me know send me a dm if you send jess a dm it's probably going to get lost because <laughs> you can get hundreds of dms um i also 
really want to like highlight our next uh, conversation because um, developing a powerful use case, there are so many companies right now. There's one that I spoke to um, last week who is working in the energy sector and is using technology or blockchain technology to be able to um, basically like, I don't want to share too much of what she's saying because it was one, extremely complicated. And number two, incredibly fascinating because she's basically onboarding like millions of users into blockchain without them even knowing about it through energy. So there's going to be companies like that in our next space talking about just the different use cases that are happening and that are being built on um, using our blockchain technology. So that's going to be really cool. And that's happening next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So again, reach out to me, put your notifications on. But I mean, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Yeah, yeah, I did go ahead and pin up that space. And again, thank you to all the listeners. Thank you to all the speakers. And thank you to the front team. And we'll be back next week. Have a great day, guys.